like the introduction to the bioinformatics slash GBS toolbox concept. So any of you that have been listening to my talks in recent months have, will have be a little bit familiar with this, this uh, section. I added it in because I think it helps um, tie some things together. So um, as you know, one of the things that characterizes us as homo sapiens sapiens is the extent of our tool use. Now, I'm, you know, we know that other species use tools, but the extent of our tool use is greater than any, anything else on the planet, right? And the more advanced we become, the more complicated our tools are, right? And when we're talking about the era of genomics, there are lots and lots of complicated tools that need to interact and work together for us to produce, you know, actual real research results, not artifacts or, or that. And, you know, there's an old, old saying, and I'm sure many of you heard it, that you know, if, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? People get really excited about GBS, and it's their hammer, and everything is gonna, you're gonna use it on everything, right? And that's not the case. I mean, it's not, not, it's not always the appropriate tool, right? So um, we need to think about the tools that we use. We need to understand the tools that we use, and we need to work with other folks that may maybe have better knowledge of this one than you do, and you may have better knowledge of that one. Right? <coughs> That's why it's so, so important to work in teams and to communicate with one another. Um, there's another, another one, I don't know if it's a saying or if I just made it up, I can't, you know, I'm a lack of sleep today, but um, you know, you could have a really great workshop at home with all the tools in the world, but you're not ever gonna be a carpenter if you don't know how to use them, right? You can have all these wonderful tools. We can have computers full of amazing bioinformatics tools. But if we don't know how to use them appropriately, we're not going to do a good job of, of our research, right? So this is, a, this is something I really you know, want to, to um, stress. Okay, again, so teamwork and communication is just vital for what we do in this age. And you know, bioinformatics is, is a process. It's not just a solution. You know, when you, as, a, as molecular biologists and geneticists, you, if you send your sequence off to the bioinformatician and expect, poof, they're gonna give me the answer. Well, that's, it doesn't really work that way. It's a process, right? You have to work together and make sure that, and you need to check things. So um, you need to have appropriate experimental design for your technologies and the proper execution of the molecular biology. So all of these things are hugely important. You need to have really good record keeping these days. When you're talking thousands of samples, you know, if you're off by a line, a shift in a line in a file, you've assigned those genotypes completely wrong, right? And what is that gonna do to your experiment? So these are really important considerations. Um, it's really good to share information, and we started talking about that. You know, what, did, what worked for, for this species, or what's, you know, what's DRAD compared to GBS? You know, what's the most appropriate tool? So working together helps that. And then testing things, you know, the bioinformatics pipelines are, you know, you, you need to be able to test them. So if you're, and GBS is the same way. So if you're starting with a new species, it's really great if you have prior knowledge on some set of samples, you understand something about the genetics of those samples, or you have another marker system that you have data with those samples, that you can then cross-check cross and say, geez, when I, when I do my GBS work, are the answers I'm getting making sense, right? Because you're always gonna get, I promise you, you will always get SNPs out of GBS, always. Are they any good? That's the real question. Right? And how do we make sure that the ones that we have in our files that we're using in the downstream analyses are good? So testing is hugely important. Okay, so there are some pretty big challenges in, the bio, in bioinformatics these days, and it's not just GBS. It's genomics, you know? Um, we get massive amounts of data. This is, this is becoming a huge, huge problem for, for the IT department, right? What do they do with all this data? How do they store it? What policies are in place? How do you keep track of which files where? You know, that's massive. The genomes, in, and you'll hear more about this in a bit uh, from, from other people, uh, that are, can be very complex with many unstable parts. Things are moving around. Um, what, is that, what does that do? What, what does that mean for the bioinformatics? Sometimes you don't have a reference genome We've talked about you know, this missing data issue that comes as a bonus with any kind of GPS experiment. And you know, how do you phase your data or impute your data to 
deal with some of this missingness if you have a reference genome. So these are all massive bioinformatics challenges. Some of them are, you know, solutions are rolling along, and some of them are just kind of still there and we need to address. So the data management is also huge. You know, genotypes must be assigned, not just to samples, they'll be assigned to samples, but they need to be assigned to the right samples. Um, so this means you need to keep records of your samples, your flow cells, lanes, and sequence files in some sort of organized fashion, right? So that you can trust that when you generate a key file, which we'll get into in a bit later, that it's, that it's correct. Um, you need to have some plan for storing sequence files. And sequence files are often processed multiple times in what we call builds. So remember earlier I said if you add more diversity into the, into the GBS system, you, you end up getting more markers? Well, we will process the same sequence files as we add more, more files, you know, more sequence and more samples on to, to capture that diversity. So we reuse these <coughs> things. Now, because we reuse these things, we need to know when, I, when, you're, when you're sitting there with a, with a hat map file and you're doing some kind of analysis, you need to know what went into that, what defines that data set that you have. So really um, builds and, and things, we're, we're borrowing a concept from computer software development, version numbers, version 1, version 1.1, version 1.2, whatever, to give it a name, a label. But that's just a label and that doesn't tell you much. What you really need to know is for whatever version you're talking about, what went into that? And so that's metadata, right? That's what's the sample information if you're having a reference genome pipe based pipeline, which reference genome version was used? Because those change over time. We know that those change over time, right? Software versions used, same as the reference genomes. They change, so you want to make sure you know exactly what you went in. What parameters did you use for each step? What kind of filtering did you do if you did any, or what kind of imputation was done if you did any? And this is all really important because we really want to be able to, you know, reproduce our, our work, right? I mean, you want to be able to say this data set is defined by this, these sets of parameters, and when you share that information or you share your data sets, you can have all of that information. And, you know, how many of you worked on mic in the microarray days, with microarray data? You remember the convention? There's the Miami convention that was kind of the minimum information. We don't yet have that for GBS, right? These are things that I've been thinking about, partly because the last um, year and a half or so in the Buckler Lab, I was running the GBS pipelines, and I was trying to think about how do we capture all this information. And I think as a community, this is something we need to think about and standardize so that, because I'm, I'm one guy and I'm not going to think of all the different bits, right? It's much better to have input from the community. Okay. And along with that, logging and audit trails. When you're running bioinformatics pipelines, um, you know, like I said, processing GBS data is a multi-step multi iterative process. It goes again and again and again. And, you know, if you don't have good logging, you can't go back and see um, what the problems were or even, you know, what did I do two weeks ago? I mean, you know, Roger, you, if you just ran everything by the command line, would you remember what you did for a particular project a month ago? No. Okay, <laughs> right? Um, so this is, uh, this is why this is really, really important. Um, this is a, 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 just give you a, a quick thing on MD5 sums, and this is just one tool out of many. This is a program that takes a, can take files of almost well, arbitrary size, really, and process them down to a unique a string of letters and numbers that identifies that thing. And if you make a change in that file and run this program again, it'll be different. That little string will be different, right? So when I, when I built a set of um, tools to run the GBS pipeline, I would run this on the input files that, for that step, right? So, and put them in a log so I knew what they were. And then I would do the same thing with the output files. And what I was left with was an audit trail. So I could actually say, here's, you know, like you start at the end with your genotypes and you can say, okay, here's this step. What went into that step? Okay, did, did, it, did what I say went into that step? Was that the thing that exactly that came out of the previous step or not? Does that, does that make sense? So you could go all the way back. And so this is really, really useful because that audit trail really, really defines the end result. It tells you, you know, what you did. And these things are really complicated and it may take months to do some of this work. Okay, here's a little plug on learning to code. It makes me feel like my uh, previous supervisor, Ed Buckler, because he's starting to talk like this all the time. But I, I agree with it. Um, 
It's really useful for automating tasks. So anything that's iterative, anything you're going to do twice, you should write, learn how to write a little script that will help you do that and keep track of your variables and do the logging for you and so forth. You don't have to learn you know, massive amounts of complicated code to do this. You just need to take a, little, a few steps. So the logging is important. It also helps with doing testing rapidly because um, you can make one change in your script, run it again, and see what happens. So it, make, it makes things much, much easier. So, uh, so I have a question. How many people in here use Excel? Oh, come on. All of you. <laughs> OK, I'm going to ask you uh, all the same question I asked Roger. So you open up an Excel spreadsheet. You do some manipulations. You sort some columns. You do this, you do that. And at the end of the, the time, let's say you work on it for two hours. Do you remember what you did and what your first step was, any of you? No, right? So when we used to do science in Excel spreadsheets, we don't even really know what we did for sure, right? So, so this is, so when I was working on the, this, the, the, this massive, massive GBS build, we worked with a lot of things in, in tabular data, you know, things in rows and columns, which, you know, a lot of people will open anything with rows and columns in Excel. Right? and play with it and do this and that. And we had things that were really, really big that were supposed to be keeping track of certain bits of information. And people would go in and edit them with Excel. And sometimes it was right, sometimes it was wasn't. wasn't. Um, and so I decided, well, I need to learn how to look at these things in a, with, with, a, with a language that's built for that. And there's a language called Awk. It's been around forever um, that really it's built for working with this kind of stuff. And, so you could use that to check to make sure that there's, you know, what the values in a particular column are acceptable for that column. And when you're talking thousands and thousands or tens and, well, tens of thousands of rows and lots of columns, um, you can't do that by eye anymore. And you can then use, this will also allow you to edit things with, you know, with a little bit of coding. But when I, I would find mistakes and then I would say, okay, I've identified these six mistakes and I want to change it. I didn't open up Excel to go in and change it, right? What I did was I wrote a, a, a bit of awk code that would identify the thing and correct it, and then spit out a log file. And then I could, I could run that, that code on the original file, and it'd make a new file with the changes, right? And I would have all of my information, because I'm not going to remember what I did either, frankly, OK? So this is self-defense in some, some respect. So learning a little bit of code really can go a long way. Okay, this slide is here because I didn't know where else to put it in the, in the, in the workshop, but um, it's a, towards the beginning is a good place. So you guys all know that I think that the key people to do GBS consist of the key skill sets consist of genetics, bioinformatics, and molecular biology. That should be pretty clear. Um, when you're starting a, a project, you really need to evaluate what kind of genomic resources are available for the species you're working on, what kind of populations do you have, what information do you have, um, what can be used for testing and so on, um, and looking for potential collaborators. Um, this is a genome-wide, and it's an open tool. That's something to keep in mind. Um, this number's gotten revised down to three to four x more SNPs. Uh, the reference-based pipeline is three to four times more SNPs than the non-reference. Um, it, it, hmm? it depends. It gets right. See, this is it's, you're, you're, this is, happens all the time. It depends. Um, Katie will talk a lot about developing um, an analysis strategy at the beginning. You know, and those of you that have been working with me on a on a on a one to one or one to three basis as we as I since I've joined Ag Research know exactly what I what I mean by this because I keep <laughs> keep doing that. Um, and I think GBS provides a really good opportunity for community work. I mean, that's what we're here doing, right? That's what I'm. That's why I'm here. To let's let's get this community up and running. We can work together and really do some cool stuff.